welcome to all of you tonight and welcome particularly to our panelists. Uh, we have four wonderful speakers with you uh, to, to, to speak with us tonight. Uh, Alyssa Raj, uh, who's uh, uh, joining us from KL and a lot of expertise in looking at cities and particularly the magnificent city of Kuala Lumpur. Arifa Tomo, uh, joining us uh, uh, from Indonesia, oil and gas background, but now looking uh, more in uh, uh, new energy and other things. So uh, lots of things happening in that space. Steve Peters from Singapore, but the Asian Development Bank, um, which has many offices around the world. Uh, and a background in waste to energy and circular economy. And of course, uh, Dr. Rihanna Moadine, who's a colleague of mine at the university and, and collaborator for several years, uh, who works a lot in social equity and looking at uh, how we can use new energy technologies to aid development and leapfrog um, uh, some of the old stuff to provide quicker and better benefits for people who uh, have access to energy services when previously they haven't. So welcome to our panelists tonight. Um, let's let's get into our uh, our Q and A and and reasonably open discussion, and we'll conduct this in a pretty relaxed way. Um, <clears throat> I'd first like to lead off with a question to Alyssa, if I might. And looking at big cities, many of us here tonight. I mean, I think Melbourne's a big city, and and many of our guests tonight will have a bit of a chuckle and say yeah, that's that's not a big city. Uh, and we've got many big cities around the region. KL is one of them. Uh, so this is very, very important for the 21st century because these big cities are going to get bigger and those on the equator are possibly going to get uh, proportionally warmer than those, um, for example, where I am at 37 degrees latitude. So what, what sort of things can we do, Alyssa, to make the cities in South Australia more environmentally friendly in a broad sense. Hi, Michael, and hi, everyone else. Um, good evening to everyone. Um, I think there's so much we can do. Uh, I think a lot of these solutions we kind of already know. It's been around for a long time. So I'm going to put a slightly different perspective, which is, you know, a city is kind of comprised of built environment, what we manipulate to live in, to use, you know, infrastructure, um, the natural environment, whatever remains from what we've changed. And then of course, what we can even further add on and manipulate in a positive manner, as well as the people and the activities that take place within it. I know I'm simplifying a little bit, but um, you know, the really important things are trying to make sure that our cities are positively impacting the environment, which is, you know, we are a long way from this, but this is really trying to make sure that our built environment is designed well. And from a natural environment perspective can we add in more because as the climate changes we are going to have to build our resilience and the natural environment is really what is going to be really helpful in mitigating climate change and global warming and as you mentioned cities in the tropics i think um in the southeast asian region we have them quite a high number if i'm not mistaken five cities that have been identified to have the highest climate risk so we really need to try to improve the natural environment and increase the resilience of cities and i think finally that last component people and activities um you know people are always going to live in cities people are never going to stop being you know active even during COVID. you know you still have to rely on being in your house and doing things or you know going out less but still you do have to go out so it's about really um trying to encourage people to create the best or to make the best choices that they can at every single level. Uh, people are comprised of, of course, governance, government systems. So it's, you know, at every level, you need to create policies that are good. You need to actually implement things that are good. Uh, businesses also need to create better solutions. And then people from the ground as users need to make better choices. Uh, the one thing I think that will probably stand out in what we should specifically do is really start to look at planning in an inclusive manner because as I mentioned earlier, we know quite a lot of the solutions. Um, we are successful in some areas, less successful in others. But when we look at it from an inclusive perspective of trying to prioritize more vulnerable communities, this will end up having a trickle effect on everything else. So maybe using mobility as an example, if we're improving mobility and Melbourne you know, has amazing um, pedestrian amenities, public transport, Okay, I'm not so great. It's getting better, but we're not there yet. Um, so, you know, if we actually do improve this, but we put one additional filter, that inclusive filter, we look at 
which communities need it the most, which communities will benefit the most. So considering maybe urban poorer communities, areas where um, social housing exists, these areas, you know, if we actually provide much better amenities and infrastructure, we will then be able to decrease the amount that they actually spend of the household income on transportation. So currently in KL, we've got between 15 to about 25, 30% of household incomes used on transport because we have high car ownerships, because quite a lot of people live really far. I think, you know, this is similar to Melbourne, the urban sprawl. So if, you know, you only needed one car per household or you could use your car less, so less use on petrol, um, this will actually free up funds for you to do other things it will probably improve your health if you choose to work so there's multiple rolling benefits um, therefore i really encourage putting an inclusive lens to the solutions that we have so that we see more benefits in addition to environmental benefits i hope that sort of provides a really concise answer <laughs> it does indeed and there's a couple of things there very interesting Alyssa. thank you the the you mentioned a few things which i, I think we'll come back to later on around um, this interplay between new technologies that are appearing and, and, and how they can have multiple benefits, not just uh, environmental benefits or not just mit carbon mitigation benefits. So thank you. Um, I, I suspect some of our discussion will, 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 will include a reef on that, but I think we should come back to that because there'll be some themes I think that'll emerge. But um, a, a reef, um, uh, if we look at the way we've done things traditionally, and and um, Alyssa was pointing to some of those things, and uh, the the way things might change. Um, a, a more traditional approach is one which is based on large, into vertically integrated uh, oil and gas companies. And South Southeast Asia has several large fossil fuel companies. Uh, what what role might those companies play in this abatement task ahead? And you know maybe how might how might they change? How might they want to change or how much might they be forced to change as well by by these disruptions that are emerging well thank you michael and hello everyone uh good night from uh, melbourne and um, i'm in here from jakarta so um actually this this question really spot on because uh, i was um, one of the guys that worked for those large fossil fuel companies before i enrolled to melbourne university and i, I take my first step in renewable when I graduated. So uh, at the global level, uh, we know that the, the fossil fuel industry is currently under increasing pressure from multiple stakeholders, uh, such as from governments, investor, and public to support or do the uh, decarbonization effort to our energy system. So, uh, and my uh, colleagues in here at New Energy Nexus told me that in terms of investment, uh, we have seen a divestment trend worldwide at the global level, where for example, at the USP, uh, US S&P 500 has fallen 48% uh, since 2015 as investor actually become uncertain about the future of the fossil fuel industry. So this one uh, definitely put a lot of pressure to the industry. And although that the fossil fuel industry remain as an important uh, part of the energy mix until today, uh, especially in the developing regions, such as where I am right now in Southeast Asia, uh, those fossil fuel industry are now seen to respond to um, looking at where and how they should uh, do their business and to rethink their current business model and this of course to uh, to do the carbonization efforts uh, to uh, participate in the energy transition and the way i see it if we look at it uh, these companies still uh, have actually they have the range of tools that are needed to make the effort to engage with the decarbonization effort those allowing them to still participate in the economy in several ways i would say uh, for example by diversifying their business model around electrification and energy services uh, there are a lot of opportunities around switching to other lower uh, GHG uh, intensity, for example, coal to gas. Uh, there are opportunities on improving their current operations by increasing the efficiency of the system or uh, exploring the, uh, the uh, technology, let's say, on the carbon capture storage technology. Uh, they could also do adopt and implement the climate focus principle, uh, with namely the ESG, the one that is really uh, in Southeast Asia, the ESG name is currently like really being talked about. So the ESG stands for the Environment uh, Social Governance. Uh, 
So they can they can apply this principle, the ESG principle, to their business model, where they could also communicate the plan to do that to their market and public. Or they can also invest or focus in uh, diversifying their business model into renewable. So uh, in conclusion, I think that the fossil industry could take these options, and there are a lot of options that I have mentioned, and they can utilize their strength, especially on their size, because they have been growing uh, so far and they, they already have the market to make uh, the change or to do the trend transition uh, to support or even to lead the movement on uh, decarbonization uh, for our energy transition. Yeah, th thank you. Thank you, Arif. And, and, and we'll come back to that. I think there's going to be a common theme there, um, particularly between um, the, these large companies which you know, have the capital and have the technical and other expertise, a track record of engaging with customers and supply chains, but also this this emergence of, of these new technologies uh, that, that, that Alyssa was pointing to. Um, another side of this whole problem is looking at um, uh, environmental impacts that aren't just uh, associated directly with greenhouse gas emissions, but for example, as our cities get bigger, um, we need to we need to be worried about things like deforestation, just land clearing. We need to be worried about uh, impacts on on uh, on natural water sources and so on. And Steve, you've got a, a lot of experience in this in this area. Uh, so, so how do we how do we manage as we decarbonise? For example, I might want to put a big solar array uh, 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 in a rainforest. That may or may not be a good thing. Um, so, so how wouldn't do we be manage? my friend if you did, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how do you how do you how do we manage these? sometimes competing issues of, of matters such as deforestation, other environmental impacts like disruption to water uh, resources um, as the global abatement tasks, particularly drives different industrialization patterns uh, at, uh, in Southeast Asia. Okay, so I could probably take that up to a 10,000 foot view or a 30,000 foot view. Sure. Um, I suppose the question is how we value it. Um, we can talk about the specific mechanisms for supporting um, activities that protect forests like REED, or we could talk about the safeguards requirements for people doing large projects in multilateral development banks. But really it's a matter of getting people to value those assets. And there's an emerging um, field in economics driven on partially by donor economics, but um, natural capital and specifically natural capital accounting is starting to become a significant issue. So we're doing a lot of work in with uh, ADBs joined up with Stanford uh, University and also with the National Reform and De uh, Development Commission and PRC to develop a natural capital lab to look at ways that we can get countries to see in their balance sheet that they have significant levels of value. And that's a hard conversation to have because people generally don't see it. I'll use a great example. Ireland just did a released a report last year saying that um, the value of their marine uh, industry was about 2.3% of GDP, and it will go up to five. But what was really what really got the Irish politicians was that Ireland is nine tenths underwater. It's only 10% of the land mass is Ireland. And if you look at countries like Indonesia, Philippines, even Malaysia, or countries in the Pacific, which are 99% water, you have an enormous amount of natural capital. So it's the, the, the way to deal with it is not to fight it at ground level because we found that hasn't really worked. NGOs have done a lot of work on it and they've had a good fight, but it hasn't stopped it. We need to get convince people that natural capital has value and it should be protected and it should be able to be included in financial accounts. Well, that's, that's a, a very important statement um, and beautifully said, natural capital has value and should be included in accounts. I thank, thank you, Steve. Now, there's natural capital, and then there's also social capital and, and, and people. And some of us are lucky enough to, to be wealthier and some of us are less fortunate. So, so just closing out our opening um, discussion, uh, Rihanna, um, you do a lot of work at looking at how technology adoption impacts different communities across Southeast Asia. So, how do you think the move to clean energy might impact the lives of the less and more socially advantaged in different SEA countries? 
Well, uh, I think um, while there is potential for clean energy technologies, renewable energy, and so on, to impact positively on uh, some of the most vulnerable uh, communities in, uh, South, in an area which has some of the most vulnerable countries in the world. Um, I don't think there's anything automatic about it. Uh, you know, in that sense, I don't think there's a technological fix to this. I think the technologies exist uh, and they can provide some real solutions uh, but there is, for us to think that there is anything automatic about this would be uh, an enormous error, really. Uh, these technologies have to be enabled in particular ways uh, to, uh, to have these uh, beneficial impacts, generally speaking, in terms of the environment, but also in uh, terms of the specific communities who are vulnerable because of poverty issues, um, which means they don't have access uh, to a range of uh, 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 services, uh, capacity, assets to uh, deal with the uh, impacts and also recover uh, to uh, varying to as strongly as possible uh, from these impacts. That is their resilience capacity is less because of a whole range of socioeconomic factors. So I don't think there's anything inevitable about it, even though these uh, uh, systems and uh, innovation does exist and they're very important. And I think this is where the concept of a just transition comes in. Uh, and this is now being discussed in Southeast Asia. Uh, and there are some projects that are also being initiated, which look at this question of the just transition. And I'm uh, you know, pleased to see that uh, some of these projects look at gender questions because women are a vulnerable group, especially poor women. Um, uh, so, uh, so this idea of a just transition is really important. And that's because this move towards uh, a low carbon, this low carbon transition is more than just renewable energy. It's more than just technology. And this comes back to the point that Alisa was making previously. And COVID, the pandemic, really uh, accentuates this. It's about a, a, a fairly profound culture change uh, that we have undergone in the last uh, 12 months. And that's not going to go away. That's going to stay with us. There are some really important lessons. So part of this transformation, part of the slow carbon transition really is a culture change, which is social, which is economic, which is individual and so on. Um, so, uh, you know, so these are the things that need to be uh, uh, understood, especially by governments, especially by policymakers and especially by the experts. Uh, and here uh, I go back to Alyssa's point, social, uh, inclusion is, is very important. I was involved in um, disaster uh, response in the Philippines during Typhoon Hainan, uh, uh, 2018, I think it was. And um, uh, this was, uh, you know, about a uh, uh, minimum of 6,000 people died. And uh, it's actually, uh, so, some estimates put it at 10,000 or more. Uh, and uh, 14 million people were displaced, 29,000 injured, 33,000 hectares of farms, 30,000 fishing boats, and so on. And this is one of the uh, this is one of the poorer provinces in the Philippines. Three in ten families live below the poverty line. That is, basic necessities are not uh, available; they can't access it. Um, so, uh, you know, so these are the uh, uh, vulnerable communities that are being affected. So we do need to uh, look at this question of a just transition, incorporate social inclusion, incorporate vulnerability analysis as we enable these technologies to do what they can do. So, well, th thank you, Rihanna. Um, so I think that leads into a question um, for Steve, I suspect, uh, most obviously, is, you know, if you are one of that three in 10 that, that Rihanna just discussed, 
um, and you know you haven't got capital to to to, to do certain things, or, or or you haven't the resilience. Um, so so in such circumstances, how do low and medium in income countries address their infrastructure and investment needs um, as as we potentially move to clean or green energy? I think that, yeah, and totally correct. Uh, Rihanna was very kind and opened a panel that we were on, um, worked in a panel that we had on Tuesday. So I'm very well aware of a point and cultural change is important. But that cultural change probably hasn't manifested yet in political leadership in a lot of the countries that, that we work in, but it's coming. Um, and uh, it's coming and it's inevitable. I, I just In my background, you'll see a photograph of the dump site at the Marshall Islands that collapsed and uh, a couple of people died. Um, and in the Philippines, where I'm actually based and meant to be based in the Philippines, it's pretty bleak. So do you do um, a large transport project in a capital city or do you do distributed engagement with people to make them more climate resilient and find them ways that their activities can actually make their climate safer and make their lives safer? And it's a challenge for governments on the policy change. And I think... Um, my concern is I think we don't, and I, I'm very much in, a, in Rihanna's camp, I don't think we do, internationally, I don't think we do enough at the ground level, at the village, the village or the cantonment or commune level in multiple activities and support organisations through perhaps local banks or local NGOs by providing funds to implement projects that actually, they may not be $300 million mega projects where, you know, a large national uh, company can employ 5,000 people, but you might have a project that can implement, in fact, the lives of 40,000 people. It, it's a challenge for policymakers. And where I work at the Asian Development Bank, our job's not to tell people what to do. Our job is to share with them what the opportunities are and then help them guide them through making decisions. But it's ultimately their decision. That's, that's, the, that's the position. And sometimes I think we get uh, criticised a bit for not being forceful, but we can't. It's not our country. You know, we've got to help people make their own decisions and they make their decisions based on knowledge and they make their decisions based on the advice of experts and what other people have done successfully. So, I mean, uh, I, could I throw that question back to, to, Rih to Rihanna, if you don't mind, Michael, saying, could you give us an example of a really good project you thought really worked? I'm sure you have one. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, no, no, that's all right. Um, uh, yeah, I'm actually working on uh, a project at the moment, which is an ADB project in the Maldives, uh, the Poised project, uh, which I think is uh, sort of a bit of an example. I'm supposed to do a case study on it. And uh, the Maldives is very vulnerable, uh, underwater. <laughs> you know, you look at the satellite images, basically it's all underwater. And um, extremely dependent on, uh, on uh, diesel. Uh, imported diesel and they're uh, 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 redoing their whole uh, distribution network and uh, integrating solar PV hybrids into the uh, distribution network. And uh, these are essentially community managed systems uh, because the, the utility can't get to some of the outer islands. And uh, some of the groups that are managing these are the women's development uh, committees. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of training and capacity building and so on. Um, so it, it's, it's a huge microgrid project because it covers around 170 islands. So uh, yeah, I think uh, projects like that have a lot of potential. Uh, I do think there is a role here for decentralized solutions. And I'm not saying small is beautiful, but there is, you know, I mean, it's not that sort of ideological camp, if you like, but I think there is a role for it. I think it fits in with the, uh, with the evolution of smart grid, uh, with more active distribution, with the concept of prosumers and so on. And we need to look at more distributed energy resources and so, and so forth. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Rihanna. You're using a lot of technology and uptake of technology there, Rihanna, having told us earlier that uh, that, that was not the uh, complete story. 
Yeah. Anyway, once you're once an electrical engineer, <laughs> always an electrical engineer. Yeah, exactly. Perhaps. That's right. But, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, um, um, Arif, I, I, I'm wondering, um, for example, in Indonesia, what kind of examples you might have there as well? Yes. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, my line of work, so uh, our organization is actually supporting for uh, clean energy startups in Indonesia, which is um, still at the early stage. But uh, I would like to um, highlight to the audience one of the uh, project from uh, one of our startups that I think is very uh, interested to talk about. So uh, it's it's happening in uh, Sumba. So Sumba is like a small island in the eastern part of Indonesia. So the problem in here is that uh, uh, Sumba uh, people still categorize as uh, energy poverty. Uh, so like, for example, uh, so around 500,000 of the household are still uh, lacking to the energy access. And there is also a, a gender component and that uh, which also mentions by Rihanna, it's, it's very, very interesting. So uh, the, the startup's name is called uh, Sumba Sustainable Solution or in short is 3S. So they try to come up uh, from the uh, uh, problem that are faced by the local uh, community there by building the micro solar home system, a uh, solar panel uh, for housing uh, that uh, include uh, three lights, a uh, battery and phone charger uh, with, a, uh, let's say, like a contract for a three year. And the local people uh, can use that uh, so the, the, the children can study at night. And uh, for its household, they only have to pay for around uh, 3.5 uh, US dollar uh, per month. And this is a really, a really important thing uh, to note because uh, uh, mostly uh, the people in Sumba only earn around one dollar per day. So yeah, so the economics point of view is also challenging, and uh, they also built uh, what they called as the um, uh, uh, productivity center, uh, where they are integrating the solar panel, uh, uh, integrated to the uh, uh, like the crop mills. So uh, the the local people there can use the energy uh, produced from the solar uh, connected to the mills so they can uh, uh, process their uh, crops uh, not manually. So they are shifting from manual labor, which is very, very important because usually the manual labor are being done by a woman because the man has to uh, find the work. So uh, with that uh, solution, with this productive center, so the productive center is actually placed on the village. So it acts as a product, uh, acts as an energy hub for the local community where, where the villager uh, come there and bring their uh, crops to the process. So uh, since they are uh, shifting from manual labor to this, uh, so the women now have uh, uh, more free time so they can, uh, you know, like take care of the kids more often. Uh, they could uh, uh, use their time to uh, produce a, a better uh, revenue, for example, by selling candle nuts or by weaving tenun ikat. So tenun ikat is like the, the craft, the very famous crafting in Sumba. So they can uh, use their uh, time to generate a better revenue. Um, so they are not really tied down by the manual labor and they have more time and then uh, they can earn more income. Well, that's, I mean, th there's some timeless um, features there that, that certainly, um, you know, reinforce what Rihanna was talking about. And I was also, when you were talking about the ability to study in the evenings and the impact that has on, on education, particularly children's education, teenagers' education, um, I'm always reminded of a very famous poem written by an Irish poet, Seamus Heaney, where he, talk, he talks about... Uh, the image of of the of the student sitting um, in a in a window. The, the, the poem is about uh, a student studying late at night at Harvard University, and the image of a student studying late at night with a, with a, with a desk lamp and a book and a pen and paper. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't matter where you are. That's that's the, the ability to have a, a secure place with some lighting where you can sit and learn. Um, Many of us online tonight and all of us here tonight have done that ourselves and the access to that is just so important to people to people's lives. So thank thank you, Arif. That's a wonderful, wonderful example as well. Yeah, um, my pleasure. So um, what one one thing uh, we haven't talked much about um, is is very immediate benefits to the general public. Um, of different clean energy technologies, particularly associated with the air they breathe, for example, um, but also there and other things, general public health impacts. And you know, we, we, we all know, and those of us who've been on the planet longer rather than shorter, will remember 
when the catalytic converter became a, a, a common um, feature in, in um, passenger vehicles um, uh, around the world and the enormous impact that had on urban air quality in Melbourne, in Los Angeles, and in, uh, uh, in KL and Singapore and elsewhere. So, so um, I'd like to talk a bit more about some of those other benefits of clean energy technologies. And Alyssa, um, you're our city's person and you live in a beautiful big city. What, what kinds of public health impacts might we see as we continue to, to adopt cleaner energy technologies? What, what, what might that mean to people's lives? Sure, I'm going to put a slightly negative spin on this question and maybe highlight what our current technology is doing really badly. And, you know, <laughs> you mentioned air pollution, right? Um, this is really interesting. And I, I didn't, I think it was maybe about five years ago when I found out how bad air pollution is related to cardiovascular disease rates as well. Um, and recently, over the last few years, we've seen court cases where air pollution has been ruled as a cause of death to a young girl in London. This was, I think, one or two years ago. Um, I think the city of London has also been sued multiple times because they've reached air quality levels because of all the negative impact. So really understanding what technology we're using in the city. So if it's transport, for example, um, you know, ideally, of course, we walk or cycle, but if we can't, we have to use a car sometimes. I mean, public transport first and then a car. If you have a car, there's always the argument of I use an electric vehicle, but my grid is actually mostly coal for, you know, the case of Malaysia. Uh, but at the same time, your emissions actually within the city is very, very, very low. So making certain decisions or changing certain areas where the overall yield is a little bit different, but the benefit to cities and the population is actually very high and it makes a big difference and your health over time or the population's health will actually improve. Um, that's the first thing. I think the second thing is we forget about the negative impacts of climate change, which is the hotter it gets, the more likely you're actually going to get heat strokes. And in the tropics, we know it's projected to get a lot hotter. Um, there's a certain temperature or wet bulb temperature where if it goes above, I think it's in its mid 30s, um, evapotranspiration cannot actually happen and your sweating isn't going to um, actually cool you down anymore. We're not there yet, but you know, in 50 years, in 70 years, we could be at that point. So we want to really avoid from getting to that point and we really do need to make sure that we actually have much cleaner technology and we really take action from today because if not, things are just going to get worse. So yeah, in a nutshell, that's my response. I, I, I agree with that very much. And uh, uh, driving big SUVs running on diesel is not the smartest thing, um, but we all seem to like doing it for different reasons, uh, with, with, no matter what city we are, we're in around the world. Um, uh, I'm, I'm wondering about things like electric bikes, things like that, what, what, what that might mean. Um, many, many big cities around the world love the bicycle, until relatively recently, and I'm wondering whether we should be loving bicycles a lot more uh, around the world. And if you're not super fit, and then Cadell Evans or his equivalent in other countries, sorry for that local Melbourne uh, 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 mention, uh, electric bikes, electric tricycles, and other kinds of micro mobility seem to me to be quite exciting prospects. Absolutely are. And I think we need to put more of that. But there's some controversy. For example, in Malaysia, we recently outlawed using electric scooters on roads. So, you know, that we do need to move towards that. But at the same time, we need to make sure that our policies are aligned. I know it's a negative example again. But yes, we do need to actually move people in smaller and less energy consuming vehicles. Absolutely. <laughs> Well, and you need to be careful with some of these things. I was nearly run over by a student on an electric scooter the other day on campus. So, so uh, I was just jealous he was so young and fearless. <laughs> I wouldn't be quite so. Um, so. So, look, I think th there's a tremendous amount of stuff we can continue to talk about as a panel, um, but I'm very mindful that we, we're getting a lot of questions from our audience. We, we, we now have well over 100 people online and, uh, and some very good questions. So, and, and, and quite different questions to, to those in, in themes that we're seeing um, from those that we've already discussed. Uh, one question here uh, uh, around startups. 
is probably to a reef primarily, but it doesn't have to be. Um, or, well, startups and Indonesia, it, it, it probably is to a reef primarily, but, but um, could, what, what examples are there of, of really innovative uh, uh, energy, clean energy startups and renewable energy startups that, are out, that we're seeing across the region? And I, I'd broaden that question a little bit to tie back a little bit to what Steve mentioned before, which was we, we have big finance for big gas turbines and big bridges and things like that. But how do governments and maybe development banks and other things support innovation and startups as well? So perhaps a reef first, if you've, if you've got some examples, I'm sorry to throw you in the, in the, in the, in the limelight there, but I think that's a very interesting question. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. So that's yes. actually uh, yes. one of the things that uh, we are focusing in here. Uh, so our job in Yonik Nexus is to uh, support a diverse startup. And uh, in Indonesia, uh, we have uh, many uh, sector of uh, the startups that start uh, blooming in, uh, but mainly are still uh, majority are still on the solar. So like uh, uh, the solar uh, startups, like uh, very a lot, uh, especially um, in the last year, I would say. And it's because that the uh, government has been really uh, actively uh, encouraging this one uh, by forming the, the uh, policies that can stimulate uh, the growth of the solar uh, startups. Uh, but we also see uh, another trend um, uh, very interestingly because uh, I've been working in here um, uh, for a year and uh, in that just one year, like the trend is also like very changing uh, quite significantly. For example, when I mentioned when I first joined uh, this company, uh, I would say that uh, the, the startup on focusing on solar is like very dominated. But uh, starting on uh, this year or like uh, end of uh, 2020, we also see the trends on electric uh, mobility. Uh, mainly because uh, you know, like uh, Tesla are now being uh, being talked about, so people are really uh, the the public interest on electric uh, vehicle uh, in Indonesia and Southeast Asia has been really uh, increasing significantly, and uh, we we also see that uh, the the startups are trying to catch up with that. So uh, we receive some applications that are uh, focusing on the charging station, uh, we are really uh, very much surprised because we didn't think that in just one year, people are like the public are switching their attention like that that quick. So um, we, uh, we have other startup other than the immobility, e uh, for example. Uh, I think one of that's still on the infant phase is, um, I, I think compared to the other sector is quite sluggish. Only one or two startups that emerge from uh, the business. Uh, we have one cohort that uh, just uh, fit this prototyping and it's actually one of the uh, the most uh, in the front line on the uh, developing the technology. So the other still, we have uh, many other startups, but uh, mainly uh, the readiness level is like a really um, a difference. Uh, I think one of the question uniquely mentioned about the DRL. So we also use uh, a different level of DRL to assess our startup. Uh, so DRL is the technical readiness level. It's from scale one, ideation to nine, where it's already established. So uh, for solar, it's usually, uh, it's already on six to nine. Uh, with energy usually on still on five or six and and so on. So I hope that's that's answer your question, Michael. T terrific, <laughs> it was a great answer, and 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 thank you for those very you know real examples of of, of the kind of innovations that are starting to emerge. Interestingly, you mentioned micro mobility yourself, something that that Alyssa and I were chatting about. I think that's a really interesting area, um, Steve. Um, um, risk capital and uh, uh, helping people uh, who haven't got a lot of money, that's what startups are all about. How, how would a big uh, 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 publicly spirited financing organisation help <laughs> for those kinds of things? For I've, example. I've got, no, I can give you a very firm example. So <laughs> I work, the organisation I work for is the Asian Development Bank that would sometimes unkindly called Asia Dams and Bridges because it was used to be focused on big infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> and there's thankfully been a bit of a renaissance. In fact, one of the, my favourite startups in anything I've seen come across my desk actually comes from Indonesia, which is a digitisation of waste treatment called Octopus. I think they're a wonderful company. I really think they're terrific. But if you look, and the, the, the example that Arif 
used about the uh, wave energy guys, they've actually come across my desk as well. So um, what, what we do is we do majority of our infrastructure funding is TRL9. So that's everything's really well established. And then that happens when that might be 25 or $30 billion worth of work between lending to governments and lending to large companies, right? Then we have another section, which is lending to banks so that they can lend on to people that sometimes do things like solar or might do um, some digitization in uh, agriculture. And then we have another group in the private sector, which unfortunately gets a lot of attention, but it's got a very limited bandwidth and that's called ADB Ventures. And that's a new organization. And it would team up with people like New Energy Nexus to come in and co-fund activities. So it might give $200,000 as a convertible grant and they'll pick a number of um, opportunities. But that business is pretty hard. That business has got a lot of, doesn't have a lot of bandwidth, doesn't have a lot of money at the moment. But actually, I think it's a wonderful business. And then the good thing is you've got my division. So I work in the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Division, and I get to play with all the crazy ideas. So I get to look at things which are five and six, TRL five and six, and sometimes even four, but I don't tell my boss. Um, and what we look at trying to do is take crazy ideas and turn them into something that might make sense. So I posted a, an answer to the Q&A, and I'll post it again in the chat, about a project that we're working on where we said, why don't we go into nearshore marine environments, capture renewable energy, either from wind, floating solar, fixed floating wind, uh, fixed wind or floating wind, uh, tidal, OTEC, anything. Let's look at what we can do. And then in some of these communities like the Marshall Islands, which I keep talking about in the background, use some of that energy to grow artificial reefs using mineral accretion, use some of it to support mariculture, to produce locally consumed foods and also food, uh, food and ornamental fish. All ornamental fish at the moment is, most ornamental fish is wild caught. Now it's being grown, so it's not being taken off the reef. And then use that balance to make hydrogen, ammonia, methanol and ethanol, and use that as an export crop or just as an export fuel, and also use it for local transport. Now, I could keep going back to the Marshall Islands, it's the fishing hub for the North Pacific fishing fleet. They use an enormous amount of fuel. If the Marshalls, which has all of these atolls, could turn around and capture some of that energy, it could actually be a fuel field. That is, that is so unusual. But when I went to it with management, they loved it. They gave us a million dollars. We're working on it at the moment. I've got a guy who's a, a retired rear admiral from the British Navy. He was the chief hydrographer for the UK. He's leading the research project. So that's some of the stuff we get to do. So it's a matter of, in our organisation, how do we gradiate the responses? So the vast majority of the work is lending to governments and to private sector. There's a little bit which is done to ventures. There's a little bit that's done to um, co-funding and lending to small institutions. And then there's a very small part that we, where I work in, which looks at knowledge, piloting, creating new ideas and engaging countries to say, hey, this is an idea. Why don't you have a look at it? You know, this might be something you could use. And that's how we kind of work. That's the, that's actually a summary of what ADB does in about 10 sentences. Oh, that's terrific. And, and the partnership model that you have with um, organisations such as Arif, I think, is a really interesting one. Mm. Uh, I, I'd also uh, might throw to Rihanna a little on this, is that uh, we don't have to necessarily partnership with new energy technology startups if we're a provider of... Uh, Low cost finance, we might support a local cooperative to uh, put up a pretty conventional distribution network along with a bit of battery or other things in a microgrid. And um, maybe, maybe it would be interesting to comment a bit on with, at, at the extreme end, I guess you might call it microfinance, but, but how um, different organizations might support more conventional ways of supporting local communities that aren't necessarily around startups and, and these advanced and high-risk opportunities. You're on mute there, Rihanna. Yes, I think uh, what, yes, when you're looking at innovation in technology, um, it's also very it's very context driven because uh, 
a technology that is innovative in one context uh, might not be might be an an older technology in another. So especially in a region where we're looking at uh, such differentiated levels of development from uh, Laos, Cambodia, Timor Leste, don't forget, is a part of ASEAN, uh, to you know the Singapore, Malaysia, and so on. So th th there are huge disparities here. So some technologies which are old in Malaysia, tried and you know uh, generalized, would be very new in uh, uh, Timor Leste or uh, Laos. So I think that this is important for us to understand as well. And um, and there are some simple solutions. I was uh, looking at this air pollution question uh, and Southeast Asia is one of the highest death, 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 death ratios due to exposure to both outdoor and household air pollution. And indoor household air pollution is apparently a major issue and it's linked to clean cooking. The lack of, you know, you use traditional, uh, uh, bio uh, energy and uh, twigs and dung and so forth. And there's an enormous amount of indoor air pollution. And uh, this is also, so indoor air pollution is also quite, quite fatal and a lot of respiratory diseases and so on. Uh, these are probably in countries such as rural country areas or not so rural areas such as Cambodia, Laos, Timor-Leste. I've worked in Timor-Leste, it's definitely a, a problem. And so here, improved cook stoves, clean cooking would be a very innovative technology, would solve a real problem, would contribute real benefits, so health and other benefits. And it could be women could do this, women could design it, they know so much about cooking, they can design these cook stoves, they can run businesses. Um, and, uh, you know, it's an innovative solution. And so let's not forget some of these gaps that still exist, which are sort of basic energy, clean energy access gaps. And when we look at some of the uh, projects, bigger projects, let's make sure that we, we look at this question as well. And um, yeah, I just want to look at this no, no, question absolutely, absolutely. And clean, that's from, very important. You know, point. from smart grid to clean cooking, you know. No, but that's, that's a very, very important point, Rihanna. And um, for you know, the classic one is the mass or wood or dung or whatever is, is a classic one, and it dramatically reduces the smoke. You know, you don't get smoke coming from a propane flame as, as you do from wood. So, so that has a dramatic impact on urban air, on on in, indoor air quality, and 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 also you know with with countries with large populations and 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 closely you know um, closely um, spaced populations high, high population densities, um, it's not surprising therefore that you know when, when there's natural resource in the form of oil and gas and real needs for addressing things like deforestation and indoor air quality, that you do end up with some very, very um, vibrant oil and gas companies servicing those populations. That's been um, the, the history of, of the oil and gas industry across the whole world and, uh, 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 and, and has been um, a, a, a tremendous um, um, benefit to things like respiratory health and other things. So, so that's you know, a very important point. Um, <clears throat> when, when I'm thinking about um, perhaps in 10 or 20 years time, when hopefully the, um, maybe it's an electric cooker that's solar driven and it's just cheaper than a propane burner, for example, uh, you know, a bit of a bit of battery and 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 solar panels maybe in a time in some of the poorer parts of the world. I'm I'm wondering what what kind of health benefits we might see in different towns and villages and in our big cities as this becomes more and more commonplace. Um, our, our understanding of these health impacts isn't itself an emerging uh, an evolving thing. But, but sort of closing out the evening and reminding ourselves, we've only got a few minutes left. If we get to say 2040, 2050, and let's 
let's let's think about um, solar being providing energy to anybody at an unprecedented low cost because that's perspective. What what might that mean for all of us in our region in twenty or thirty years' time? That's a question to all of you. Who, I don't know who'd like to go first, but but I'm trying to get a sense of you know what what could we look forward to other than hopefully just deep decarbonisation. I'll kick off. Okay. By all means, Steve. Okay, so um, we hear a lot about electric vehicles and that we sh everything should be electric. And in fact, small vehicles, sure. But larger vehicles probably do do better on liquid fuels or gaseous fuels. So um, I think if we're going to talk about where I s personally, this is not my bank's position, this is my personal opinion. I think we're going to go to having you know, significant levels of solar access, but also access to other forms of renewables and we will use intermediate fuels. And they'll probably be along the lines of hydrogen, methanol, ethanol, or ammonia. And those will be our transport fuels. And we will have a mix between battery and range extension on liquid fuels. And we will use those types of fuels, specifically hydrogen for high temperature applications, whether it's steel or tempering um, metals for industrial applications. Um, I think increasingly over the next five and 10 years, the oil and gas industry will be demonized. Um, I think you're seeing this already in the, there's a wonderful graphic which talks about the, the growth of Orsted, NL and Eater Ebola in terms of the market capitalization over the last two decades and all the other energy majors, because you're finding that the small second tier and third tier energy companies are the ones that are adopting to do the sort of large scale stuff. And then we have small businesses and innovators who are looking at doing the small scale stuff. And I don't mean, um, I don't necessarily mean startups, I mean community based businesses. So I think that's the way we're going to go. Um, and I, I, everyone seems to be obsessed with the term base load energy. Well, I, I call that out. I think base load energy is much the same as saying, I've always driven a petrol car. Why would I drive an electric car? I think uh, base load energy is a fallacy. You know, if your business relies on being there 24 hours a day, maybe you haven't got such a great business. That's my view. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, Alyssa, let, let's say uh, uh, everybody yeah, has got um, uh, uh, an electric scooter. The, the ban's <laughs> been lifted by 2049. Um, uh, <laughs> and... Uh, and there's uh, uh, Australian green hydrogen being shipped to Malaysia uh, or, and, and, and uh, so floating solar in, uh, uh, off, uh, in, on lakes and, and, and seas nearby. What, what, what might KL look like in 20 or 30 years' time in terms of you know, the noise, the, the air quality and other things? I think there'll be a slight improvement, but at the same time, I think um, you know, just relying on technology is not going to be just. Like I think, you know, Rihanna's mentioned a lot. If we just really only improve energy, we're not going to address the issues of who will be able to afford these two wheelers, even if it's allowed and even if it can be done. Um, you know, yes, the environment will be a little bit better for sure. Um, you know, health will be better in that sense, but there might be more noise whizzing about from everyone going around in their scooters as well. So there's unforeseen things that could happen, you know, if it's not planned out well and if it's just sort of technological solutions only. I think we really need to think about people and the environment that we live in and also address these as we're working on the energy transition because that is, of course, very important. But our lifestyles, you know, yeah, Rihanna really hit the nail earlier when she mentioned COVID has been such a huge impact on everyone and how we move along after this, what decisions we make um, is going to really shape everything that comes after this. So let's not forget that, um, despite the fact that, of course, we will have much better emissions, but will KL really be amazing? Probably not. It'll be a little better, but not amazing, unless we address everything. Okay, right. What about in Jakarta, Arif, uh, uh, with, yes. with uh, New Energy Nexus, <laughs> burning out a few unicorns as they call them now uh, uh, something not, that, that, 
knocking off either but I can't even say it at this time of night. Um, uh, either of but I can't say it, can't say it at 10 p.m. Uh, <laughs> As a, a wonderful Indonesian clean energy company has knocked them off in 2049, how, how will it look? Yeah, uh, I'm so glad that uh, New Energy Nexus name has been mentioned repeatedly. Uh, I think my, <laughs> my boss will be in here. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, but looking at uh, what uh, Alisa and Steve have mentioned, so uh, I came across a stumble to the uh, analysis done by uh, Climate Analytics. Uh, this is mainly where uh, I think there is a, a convention to talk about the carbon neutrality and uh, Indonesia actually in particular, uh, we at that time, we are still very unsure to go with the flow on uh, agreeing on the uh, becoming carbon neutral debate 2050. Uh, uh, at that time, I think the target is still 2070. And just uh, last month, uh, they updated the plan. Uh, so uh, we are aiming to be uh, carbon neutrality by 2060. So what I want to highlight is um, the report from Climate Analytics actually mentioned that uh, the, the regional scope on Southeast Asia, uh, the report mentioned that it's actually feasible for uh, Southeast Asia to be carbon neutrality um, by uh, 2050. And in 2030, it is estimated that 50% share of um, the electricity generation could be decarbonized by 50%. So that's something that I personally really look up. And uh, Steve mentions about the role of the excess renewable energy on solar and wind. That's uh, hydrogen is actually one, one type of energy that not in my radar. Uh, when I was sitting as a student in University of Melbourne, when, when I'm being teach about uh, hydrogen, I was like, it's, it's like really in the future, like it's not going to happen anytime soon because I don't think like a large scale electrolyzer would be in the picture. But um, with the price of um, solar and wind energy coming, coming down um, uh, quite significantly uh, in the recent times, uh, it, it started to come into the picture. And actually my view on hydrogen has been changed. Uh, I, I believe that hydrogen um, should be uh, incorporated on our pipeline uh, to, uh, uh, to uh, battle on the uh, climate change. Because actually when, if we talk about a just transition, if we talk about the emission, uh, we, uh, green, uh, green hydrogen is uh, very essential to abate the climate change because some of the industry is um, that are the economies of producing emission is very hard to abate, it's very hard to reduce the emission because um, some of the industry, uh, for example, on the aviation sector, shipping, long distance uh, trucking, concrete and steel manufacturing, uh, you mentioned it, they need a high energy density and uh, or intense heat, which could be met by uh, green hydrogen, which are, uh, can be uh, in the picture right now as the solar and wind uh, price are coming down. Uh, so um, uh, for me, it is something that I'm, I'm really looking forward. Uh, I hope that uh, the Southeast Asia government will uh, take that into account and start to consider hydrogen to, to be in the pipeline as well. So I'm, I'm quite optimistic, Michael. 